Hello, and welcome to another episode of Envisioneering Exchange, the podcast where industry leaders discuss the most important topics in sustainability, climate change, buildings, and urban efficiency. I'm Vic Marinich, Global Marketing Director at Dan Foss, and I'm delighted to be the host of this podcast. You can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners know that we've already done uh, several podcasts around heat pumps and the critical role they're going to play in helping us reach our global decarbonization goals. Uh, You can go back and listen to some of our previous podcasts. Uh, Episode 45, we had a talk with Steve Nadell of ACEEE. Episode 46, we talked with Ron Dimitrovic of uh, EPRI. And then in episode 48, we talked with Paul Selking of Water Furnace, talking about geothermal systems. So we've really covered uh, heat pumps very well. So we're going to kind of wrap up the topic today, or maybe wrap up the topic, and close it out talking with Stanley DeVries. We're going to cover the hydronic side of heat pumps. You know, everything we've talked about up until now has really been focused on the refrigeration circuit, uh, the refrigeration loop. So we want to make sure we're covering both sides here and also talking about the hydronic side and ensuring that we don't lose all those efficiency gains that we talked about on the heat pump side once we get the water into the building. So Stanley is an application and development expert in hydronics and HVAC systems at Danfoss. So Stanley, thanks for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Vic. So uh, maybe can you tell our listeners a bit about your background and how you became involved in uh, hydronics? Yeah, I've been uh, working for Danfoss for uh, going on 25 years, I would say. Of those 25 years, I've spent 15 years in uh, in business development, more or less talking about hydronics all over the world, from Korea to the US to uh, Brazil to uh, Middle East. And before I came to Danfoss, I was actually a balancing and commissioning engineer. So that was kind of the fit that went in there, right? So Danfoss wanted to expand in this business and uh, I had, would say, hands-on experience with all the products and, and how it worked and how it uh, it went on in real life. So it has become a bit of a passion of mine to talk about uh, this topic. And also uh, last year, I switched to, uh, to more to an application uh, role because I've always been more at technical guy than I was a commercial guy. So uh, let's say the explanation of the hydronics uh, that I've done all over the world is now past and now it's becoming more uh, a sales job and this is not my thing. So I'm now I'm supporting uh, our um, application department with my knowledge. And uh, maybe also interesting to note here is because I'm pretty sure some of your listeners are trying to place my accent right now, is that I'm actually a Dutch guy. So that would explain uh, the weird sounds you hear from me. Yeah, Yeah, fantastic. So yeah, it definitely sounds you've got the background that we need uh, here to talk today. So as I said, in previous episodes, we've talked about the heat pump itself. So it's generating that hot air, it's generating that hot water, and we've kind of left it at the uh, outlet of the unit, right? But just as important is what happens with that hot water after it leaves the heat pump. So can you maybe give us a quick overview of the hydronics loop, you know, the primary side, the secondary side, how they're working together in the HVAC system? So uh, you have the primary site or the primary loop, maybe, uh, and this is where the heating and cooling generation takes place. So these are the chillers, boilers, or heat pumps, or whatever you have. And there's compressors there and condensers and all that fancy stuff. And then usually that is connected to what we call the secondary loop in the building. That is the, the one that is transferring the energy to the building. And most of the time there is like a a manifold in between, or there might be heat exchanger there to transfer the energy from the primary side to the secondary side. Although I must say it is not always the case that you have a clear primary and secondary side because the, uh, sometimes al- also the same water that flows through the chiller is also immediately transferred into the building. So it is a bit complex, but I, I guess for the discussion at hand, we are talking about the secondary side. So that is let's say the pipes and the FENCO units and the air handling units that are actually actively transferring the, the energy to the building. And it's also very important to understand that this needs to be an efficient system because you cannot have an efficient system on the one side. So you have a very fancy uh, a heat pump that is, you know, has a very high COP and, and then on the secondary side have over pumping and have, uh, you know, lots of imbalances in the system. I mean, I think a good way to look at it is just like 
the secondary side might be the blood vessels of the of the building in a way you know and you know that if the blood vessels in your body are not in good condition and are not operating properly then your whole body basically needs to work harder to get everything going and it can also catastrophically fail well Mm -hmm. yeah for sure makes sense there so okay clear now we talk on the secondary side when we're talking about the building loop but then what specifically on that side is hydronic balancing right i mean don't you just have some pumps and the water goes through the building and everything's fine I wish it was that simple, but essentially, if you look at uh, hydronic balancing, then we look at water distribution, right? So uh, how do we distribute the water through the building? And then also we need to be aware that it's not only a full load uh, situation, so where everything is running on uh, maximum load. Most of the time, or I would say even all the time, buildings are running in some kind of partial load. So there's always some part of the building that's not uh, open or not heating or not cooling and and this partial load is actually coming into much better focus um, now because that is actually the part that we need to be worried about so for sure balancing is important uh, when we talk on the building side but is it also important when we talk about the performance of the heat pump itself for sure as i mentioned before it's kind of you know all the parts of the building, you know, need to work together properly. And it's because it's a system. And it is, this is also maybe one of the um, challenges that we have in our business is that we are making a building, which is basically one system. Like you can see it like a car, for example, or like any, uh, or a TV or whatever, any device that is one thing. However, because of how the market is structured, we see a lot of different components that are going into that system. And often people think, okay, it's very easy because a chiller is a chiller, right? And a valve is a valve and an air handling unit is an air handling unit. But all these things need to be properly aligned. And this is also why the role of the the designer consultant is actually crucial here is because he needs to be able to make sure that all the parts work together properly and then use the system as a system, right? And not see it as kind of like different components that you can just mix and match Mm -hmm. and changing things just randomly. Right. Certainly it's important for the heat pump to run efficiently that we've got a well-balanced system. It's important for the building, I guess, the comfort and the efficiency, it's balanced well. Are there different ways that you can balance the system on the building side? And what are some of the trade-offs between those different options? Yeah, there are a couple of different uh, solutions, although I would say they're also somehow are a bit um, more old-fashioned because in the beginning, we did um, what we call manual balancing. This is um, where we have a valve that we can basically measure and then set to a flow. And that is a very involved process, also very complicated. I mean, I, I guess uh, you want to talk about that as more as a podcast in itself. But in the US, they are, these, these manual valves are um, mostly um, replaced now by auto flows, so that are automatic flow limiters. I'm going to be a bit provocative here and going to say that auto flows are actually worse than manual balancing for certain reasons. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just uh, finish the, the row of, of solutions and then I'll come back to that. Um, and then uh, right now, what is also kind of coming up in the last years, we have pressure controllers where we put pressure controllers on branches and try to balance in that way. And what is, I would say now the last 20 years maybe is starting to come up really strong is pressure independent control valves. So what Danfoss is a very strong uh, proponent, we are saying pressure independent is actually the best way to do it. So if you talk about trade-offs, then we were saying manual, then the manual is very time consuming. It's also not very easy to do. I know that actually in the US you have a number of good companies that can do it. However, it's also important to realize that manual control is basically for full load situations. And uh, because that's how you balance, right? You put everything on full load and you start to do the manual balancing. As I previously said, that is actually a very uncommon situation. So you're balancing now the system for something that doesn't really happen. And then we go to water flow, which is, you know, doing an automatic limitation here. But so it is less time consuming and also uh, less prone to errors when we do the actual balancing. However, in partial loads, auto flow actually performs really, really badly in the sense that if there's a control valve behind, which usually there is, right? So you have a 
a thermal unit, which could be a fankel unit or an air handling unit or something that has the, the water flowing through it. Uh, usually it would have both a, a control valve that actually controls the temperature in, this, in, the, in the room or in the system, wherever you want to be. And then you have a balancing valve, which could be then a manual or an auto flow. The problem is the auto flow tries to maintain the flow. So at the point that you want to reduce basically your um, energy capacity in the room and you close the control valves, then the auto flow is starting to, to open up again. And so in partial load, auto flow is really just making your control bad. Uh, and that means that zero to 10 volt control doesn't make a sense, just put on off there. So that is, I would say for auto flow, what is my private frustration with it? Uh, pressure controllers are good and they, they definitely uh, make uh, balancing also easier. However, uh, we feel that PICV is the all in solution here because uh, basically a pressure independent control valve or PICV, I, I think is the, the American uh, terminology, is basically a pressure controller on every valve. So that is more or less the best you can get. Uh, it's the easiest to balance. There's also no way to make mistakes. And it's also very good at controlling and very precisely controlling things. So this is also a bit how we see it in the in the rest of the world. As I was saying, I have spent a lot of time in many, many markets. Uh, we see in most markets already uh, that the PICV is the leading solution. And in, in the US, we're still a bit behind, I would say, but uh, in, in that respect. But you also see that now the market is changing also because the commercial options are now uh, better. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, to summarize, if, if I got it right, so when we talk about the auto versus the manual valves, you're really talking a installed cost versus performance, right? So the manual valves cost a good bit to install, take a long time to set up and all that stuff, whereas the auto uh, valves, you can install quicker, but then you, you pay for it a bit uh, when, when you're running uh, off of a peak load, right? Whereas the pressure-independent valve, you kind of get the best of both worlds, right? I mean, it'll be a e easier, faster install. And because it's uh, pressure independent, you're able to run across all the different uh, corners of the operating envelope. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I guess, I mean, it's good that you mentioned it because I'm, I kind of missed that uh, point is that the PICV is actually also the two valves in one, right? So we can do both the control and the balancing in one valve, which means that, you know, less valves to install, which is also less time consuming. And technically, uh, right now, it's the best solution on the market. There's, uh, I think, among experts, very little disagreement around that. Yeah, you kind of touched on the point, right, that when we talk about the heat pumps themselves, they're rated with a, a SCER or SCOP, right, a seasonal rating. And, and we do that on the units because we're never or almost never operating at, at the full load, right? 100% of the building load at uh, 100 uh, degrees Fahrenheit or whatever the, the, the design conditions are, we're very rarely operating there. So we look at it from a seasonal approach to try to look at efficiency, how that unit will operate throughout the year. So do we do similar things when we uh, are looking at the secondary side, the hydronic loop? You mentioned on how the valves can operate differently in full load versus part load. Is there uh, some kind of standardized rating points or some kind of uh, set methodology on when we're looking to set the valves or if they're pressure independent valves, maybe, uh, right, doesn't matter. And they, they, take care of it themselves. But kind of how do we evaluate building performance that way across the full uh, envelope? And then does that have any impact on how we would have to balance the system? That's also a bit complicated because usually, I mean, we are um, designing for a full load, right? So essentially your system uh, is designed for extreme conditions because, you know, it's nice if it, uh, if it is 20, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on metric, but <laughs> if it's like 70, uh, 70 inside if it's like 80 outside but if it's 100 outside you will still want to keep 70 inside right and so generally speaking you're designing for some kind of extreme outside temperatures or some extreme load i mean if you have lots of computers in the room for example it could also be uh, uh, quite warm there and this is why we are going usually into partial load and then how you do that is Unfortunately, you have to design for this extreme. There are different ways also to do that, I would say. I mean, what you see also is that many consultants are using some kind of diversity factor where they say, you know, it is very unlikely that the whole building will on full load. So most of the things are uh, dimensioned for 70%, for example. 
and that makes it um, also different to do the balancing, right? Because if you have, for example, a pump that is doing only 70% of the flow, but you want to do manual balancing, so now how are you going to do that? Uh, because you need full flow to, to balance. So, and, and this is where I think also the pressure and the bandit control valves come really into their strength because it just set it to the maximum flow you're going to need at that particular point. So if it's an air handling unit or a Fanco unit, you just know because the designer calculated that how much you need, you just set it to that particular uh, set point and then let the control. So that means the actuator on top of the valve figure out how much flow is needed at that particular time. And it will always give exactly that and not more and not less. And that is uh, makes the whole balancing issue maybe even very simple uh, in that way is that, you know, you don't really need to think about it as long as you have the right equipment there, then it's OK. You don't need to uh, to worry so much about the balance and it will be good in full load and partial load. But so let's say maybe they don't have the pressure independent valves there and, and you've got a building owner, they're installing a heat pump. How can uh, they check to see if that system is uh, balanced or unbalanced uh, uh, once it's in place? Well, usually I think I would urge building owners to look at it uh, a bit holistically, right? I mean, I know um, uh, a lot of Americans like uh, hot running cars, like, uh, right? I mean, you wouldn't double the horsepower in your car without actually looking at are the brakes still okay or are the, uh, you know, is the suspension and you just going to drive the car around and then hope that everything works. So if you are replacing your generator, if it's the cooling or, or heating generator, and if it's a heat pump or a chiller or a boiler, doesn't matter. You need to look at that part because it, you can put a very expensive chiller in the building that has a very high COP or a very expensive uh, uh, heat pump. But if your if the blood vessels in your building are not distributing the water properly, or if your secondary system doesn't fit your primary system for some reason, then you know it's never going to be efficient. I mean, one of the things that we see now, um, and I'm going to jump up for a few minutes to the other side of the Atlantic, if I may. In Europe, the legislation about around buildings, energy performance uh, of buildings directive, specifies also that if you replace your uh, heat generator or cooling generator, so chiller, boilers, heat pumps, you have to look at the secondary side. So you have to see is the balance properly. So basically, it's, it shouldn't be something that you do after you replace it. It should be something that you do as a uh, integrated project in that, in that way. And that actually brings up a really good point, because here in the U.S., historically, heat pumps hadn't been so popular. We're very much uh, running with natural gas and boilers and furnaces and so on. So I would expect Going forward, when you're doing a retrofit, we can see a lot of boilers, say, being replaced by heat pumps. And that may well mean that the primary side temperatures are going to be lower. And that, of course, is on purpose, right? We, we want to run at lower temperatures. That gets us uh, even better efficiencies and so on. But to your point, that will have an issue back on the secondary side, right? So if you're running, uh, say, with pressure independent valves, is that kind of issue may be uh, mitigated a little bit or you know if you're going to make uh, such a change from a boiler to a heat pump do you really uh, you know potentially have to replace or whether it's terminal units valves and so on on the secondary side well i certainly think that you have to carefully look at it right i mean heat pumps and let's say if we're talking about uh, heating heat pumps and radiators to me is not a very logical uh, combination because radiators tend to have kind of high supply temperatures while for example, heat pumps and floor heating is great, and uh, and the same goes for the for the cooling side, and uh, and I think that what you will see is that uh, coming to pressure independent valves is that if your system is somehow um, suited for using uh, and it's also possible that for example radiators might work with heat pumps because it's also a very known tendency uh, in the consult to basically put safety factor on safety factor on safety factor on safety factor so maybe your radiator is pretty uh, is oversized and then it would work with the lower temperature so you should certainly look at that if you put uh, pressure independent control valves there then more or less you do know that uh, you you can actually get the right flow there and also make sure that it, it limits it because one of the things that that is also important if we're looking at uh, specifically heat pumps, but actually for also chillers and boilers is the actual delta T in the system. 
So what is the temperature of the water going out of your generation and what is the temperature coming back from the building? If this is very small, then you know immediately you're losing efficiency because you're, you're using your system in a way that it's not supposed to be used. And we see this also, and I, I mean, I think if you look at specifically a bit older buildings, like 10, 10 years older, and you walk into the technical room and you look actually at the temperatures that are going in uh, to the building and coming out, most of the time it's really very small delta Ts. So you know that there is a balance problem there. You know that there is a uh, an overflow maybe, or that uh, maybe even they use the wrong system because also three-way valves used to be a thing. And then you also know that you're losing a lot of energy on you know just pumping water because if you pump too much water, then your pump is just basically you know using too much energy. And this is not a small component in the in the system. It is about 25% maybe of your total energy consumption. So if you can save 10% on that, or 20 or 30 or 40, this is uh, uh, some serious uh, savings already. So the pumping is wrong, but also your heat pump is not optimal. And you could also say that if you have the um, distribution under proper control, then you can even make it smarter if you have the right data, because then you can start to play also with the supply temperature on the on the heat pump. And if you can vary the heat pump uh, supply temperature, then you can make huge savings as well. And I mean, you just mentioned, you know, like the temperatures might be higher in old systems. And then if you are putting a heat pump in, it might be a lower. So, uh, but it is also possible that, you know, you need this high temperature only at, I don't know, maybe 10% of the year, while the rest of the time you can run on a much lower temperature, which would then give you much better, um, you know, efficiency. And also the, the system will just run that much better. Because that's also one of the things. I mean, if you if we're talking about um, balancing issues that can arise from bad balancing, then you know it's it's the capacity is wrong, or you know usually it's some somebody's uncomfortable. The solutions that are usually applied can be make things worse from an efficiency standpoint, right? So uh, okay, you know uh, some guy is cold, so we'll just turn up the pump because for sure he has too little flow. And all those things together make your heat pump investment maybe not that good on the return because you know you're not using it fully. You're not getting all the efficiency out of it that you should be. Right. I mean, it almost sounds like for what you were saying. I mean, the, the pressure independent valves should almost help you. I don't want to say future proof your system, but if you're running with a boiler today and you're putting in these pressure independent valves, when you're ready to switch to that heat pump, then maybe you can uh, save yourself a lot of headache and having to rebalance the system and do everything else, you, you know, given that you're going to drive that temperature down. And, and of course, having those pressure independent valves on your boiler is going to make the building run more efficient there anyway. So, I mean, it sounds like maybe a good uh, upfront uh, thing to do. And then I know with the radiators, and I know a little bit about how they're designing the heat pumps in Europe. And as I know, they are trying to make some models that will get even higher temperatures because there's a lot of older buildings, you know, poorly insulated buildings in uh, in Europe. And so you do need higher temperatures to get to those radiators. And so you can't just throw out a boiler and put in something that's going to be running 30 degrees lower temp and expect it to be comfortable. So I do know that a lot of the manufacturers are looking to make high temp heat pumps. I'm sure they're going to cost more and, and not be as uh, efficient, but there are those opportunities still to get rid of boilers on that side. So it seems like there's some things to take into consideration when converting over from a boiler to a heat pump. But I think if you think about it ahead of time, then it can actually be a, a pretty relatively simple uh, move. So any uh, maybe tricks, tips that you've seen that things get missed as uh, installers are, are converting over to heat pumps, something that maybe uh, they should consider that most people don't? Yeah, I think that uh, one of the things is uh, buffer tanks, right? I mean, that's uh, not always in the system there, which can make uh, definitely the control of the, the heat pump, pump a bit more stable. And I think in general, what you want is you want stability in the system and changes to be gradual and slow. And this is done best if you have a precise control. And if you make sure that you have no overflows, that you have the distribution properly on the control. Uh, I think that is one of the one of the issues is that the, the market is shifting towards heat pumps for for certain reasons. 
I guess we all know why that is. We want to be more energy efficient. We want to be a greener. And this is also a very uh, important shift, right, in our uh, business. And, and that means that everybody needs to get used to it, to it and, and know how to design with it, but also how to install it and, and also how to control it. And specifically, if you, if you look to smaller systems, I mean, we're usually, I mean, I mean uh, HVAC systems in big buildings, but if you look at private residences or, or uh, those things, then how do you control a system and you know how do you optimize it i mean most heat pumps can do both the heating and the cooling i mean i guess that many people would actually appreciate that but then how is this controlled one is the switch over point and i think also the control here is definitely something that needs some careful consideration where okay so how do i do this and then if you then have also at least the the proper hydronic balance and the and the right equipment then you know, you know that whatever you want to do with it, it's always going to work, right? It's always going to do it uh, in the way that you expect it to, because that's that's also the thing. It is a very predictable way to control your system, and it will be always optimized in that way. So uh, maybe you use the word future-proof. I mean, I would definitely say that if you use PICV, you're good for the next 20 years, and then maybe we will, you know, engineers are always finding the next smart thing so maybe they will find some new things but right now i think uh, i think you will be good with uh, pressure independent valves previously you brought up a really good point uh, on the operation side right that okay everything is nice and shiny and new when you put in uh, the new valves the new heat pump the new everything else but then some months in right uh, maintenance is getting a call this person is too hot this person's too cold uh, you, you know it's uh, too humid wh whatever it is and then everybody starts tweaking, tweaking, changing, tweaking, changing without any uh, consideration of, right, the whole system, right? You just need to address that emergency that you have today, right? Uh, this person is cold, hot, whatever it is. And that can really lead, like you said, to making a mess out of the whole system. So when we properly design, balance the secondary loop, do you have any rules of thumb or insights into what kind of uh, value you can get, right? What kind of uh, energy or efficiency gains can you get? from fixing all those kinds of issues and making sure the system is running well and balanced all the time. For sure, I, I would also go back one step to your uh, remark also about, you know, tweaking the system. We also have to realize that the guys that they usually send to buildings to fix these kinds of problems are not trained to see this. Uh, and they basically, usually they know how to maintain a boiler, but they are not trained to balancing experts. They're not trained consultants. So it's for them, it's also... I would say basically impossible to to do it, and this is also why you need to make the system a proof against this kind of uh, of of interference, or ba basically make sure that they don't need to interfere in that part of the system. That they only need to make sure that the boiler is well maintained, that the heat pump is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that they don't need to touch the hydronics. And then as to you know savings, it's always a bit tricky, right? Because what are you comparing it to? Are you comparing it to a a decently balanced system and then upgrading to PICV or the system basically is uh, badly balanced and it's not done and everything is uh, is bad, then there's a difference. I would say that if you have an existing system, an existing building that is somehow halfway decently designed and, and also has uh, at least somebody had look, has looked at balance, I mean, savings of 30% are pretty easy and even 50% is not outlandish. I mean, because that is, again, the thing is about making the whole system work properly and making sure that all the energy is transferred in the proper way. If there is no um, proper distribution, it will not function. This is just how it is. So we've seen 50%, but I would say a rule of thumb, 30% easy. And that is basically what we can uh, uh, see. We also have many case studies where we can see that actually it's pretty sizable. Yeah, absolutely. And and when you think all the focus is typically on whatever the boiler, the heat pump, the chiller, because that's the big capital expense, right? I mean, you're talking tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? So everybody wants to get that extra tenth of a COP or tenth of an SEER out of that unit. They're so focused there. But then if you don't have that building uh, properly balanced, you know, if you can save 30% by balancing it, it means you're costing yourself 30% by not doing it right in the first place. So all that money you spend to get that unit that's 10% more efficient, you can easily lose 30% on the building side. So that's, uh, I think it's great to consider, yeah. 
Yeah, it's kind of logic, right? Because that is the big ticket items, right? The, the PDF bundle cost uh, bundle. And then uh, I would also like to highlight another problem that I've seen specifically, uh, no, not actually specifically in the US, but in the US it is also, is the scope of the projects, right? Who is doing what? And right now, uh, the mechanical side is doing the balancing while the control is to the system integrator, basically, right? And if you look at it from those two separate uh, ways, then maybe, you know, PICV doesn't look that attractive because the guy on the mechanical side says, yeah, okay, I just put this auto flow thing here and everything is balanced and it's fine for me. And if you look at the, um, the system integrator side, then the guy says, yeah, you know, I need a control valve and this uh, PICV is, is a bit more expensive than a control valve. So why would I just need to do that? However, if you look at it in total, first of all, you don't need to mount two valves, just one. And the balancing side becomes easier. So there's less work from that side for the mechanical engineer. And we also see that the, the system integrator has a much easier time of actually, let's say, doing the, the commissioning also of the controls. Because, for example, usually you don't do this for FANCO units or smaller applications, but an air handling unit control is usually also tuned, right? So they will mess with the PID settings until it's stable. All these things will be much easier if you use pressure independent controls. And if you look at the whole picture, then it makes no sense to go any other way. However, if you take the balancing function and the control function apart, then it looks a bit, then from those two perspectives, it looks a bit different. So it is again, very important that if you look at your big ticket items, like your, your heat pumps and your, that you also look at your secondary side, but you also look who is doing what and what is that costing you? And that you basically add your quote from your system integrator and your mechanical engineer together and say, okay, this is now the total costing and not say, okay, this mechanical engineer is like 5% cheaper. So I will take that one, even though he uses auto flow and not PICVs. Super interesting uh, discussion here today, Stanley. Thanks. Uh, before we wrap things up, is there something I didn't ask you or a topic you want to cover before we close out today? Well, I think we covered quite a lot of ground today uh, and maybe we touched all the points. I would just like to stress here that, you know, hydronics matter. It's the thing that makes everything work and there is no shortcuts here. There's no uh, cheapening things up. I mean, one of the things is that I hear often is value engineering, which is usually a, a, a different word for saying, okay, we will just uh, cut some cost. I would say, um, I mean, if you value engineer out your PICV, you're costing your customer money. This is the thing that uh, maybe I would like to stress here. One of our colleagues uh, once said, uh, nobody would dream about value engineering out a drive for the pump or for the air handling unit or something like that. And essentially the market needs to go to the place where we say, okay, in value engineering, we cannot make shortcuts on the hydronic balance. However you do it, right? There are different solutions, but you need to be aware that this is not something that you can just ignore. Yeah. And as you said, with a 30% energy savings potentials in, in hand, for sure, it can't be something uh, that's going to be ignored. So, Stanley, thanks for uh, joining us on the show today. Yeah. Thanks a lot for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to your listeners. I hope it was interesting and uh, maybe uh, we can do another. Yeah. So that's it for this episode of Envisioneering Exchange. I'd like to thank my guest, Stanley DeFries of Danfoss for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to Envisioneering Exchange on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate, review, and share the episode with your network. Thanks for listening and talk to you next time. This podcast is for information purposes only. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Envisioneering Exchange podcast series are solely those of the individuals involved and not necessarily represent those of Danfoss LLC and its employees. Danfoss LLC is not responsible and does not verify for accuracy any of the information contained in the podcast series available for listening on this site. This podcast series does not constitute professional advice or services. This podcast, including Danfoss LLC and the producers, disclaim responsibility from any possible adverse effects of information contained herein. Opinion 
opinions of guests are their own, and Dan Foss LLC in this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility of statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about the guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein. This podcast is available for private, non-commercial use only. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute this podcast. The developers of the Envisioneering Exchange podcast site assume no liability for any activities in connection with this podcast or for use of this podcast in connection with any other website, computer, or playing device.